LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, wildlife control consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad to have you on board. I hope that your week went well. Uh, mine was less than stellar this past week, but uh, anyways, things are moving along, as they say. We're having we're in the midst of a major wind event here in where I live. Uh, so here in Montana, we get a lot of wind. So, uh, but I guess for those people that have windmills, this is a um, pretty strong gust. It's been going about 18, 20 miles an hour for. Oh, 15, 16 hours, I think, probably by now. And I don't know when it's going to stop. Anyways, uh, do take a few moments, if you would, to sign up to the podcast. Of course, ring the bell so make sure you're being notified of some updates. Uh, There have been some issues with getting the podcast up. Again, I don't post it for the Pest Geek podcast. Uh, if you're like I don't, I like to have consistency. You're always willing. You're always able to go to Rumble. I upload my podcasts up to Rumble, and you just look under Wildlife Control Consultant, and you can obtain it there. And I'll post some links sometimes on on Facebook as well. Would love to hear from you in terms of comments. You can reach me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com would love to hear your comments and praise and criticisms and thoughts for perhaps different shows shows that you might that would be interesting for you and needful for you and the training that you would like to look for uh that would give me some ideas otherwise as i've said before i will just talk about what interests me all right. Well, uh, you can see my website here. It's it's a different look. I've had problems with my website, so I have hired a web person to come in and put up a new design, and that is going to be forthcoming. I have finally given up on WordPress. I have had enough of WordPress. I simply don't have the time to be fussing with it. If you enjoy WordPress, God bless you. I I am done with WordPress. So I am going with a different model. Of course, that's that's another thousand dollars plus out of my out of my wallet. And I have a very simple website. So I've got not only they're gonna create the architecture and then I've got to then populate it with all my old materials. So that's that's the future I'm looking for. Again, not too happy about it. Uh, but I'm hoping that this new path forward is going to just save me time. Because I, for me, my website's just kind of a billboard. It's not changed that much. So, uh, if you're, so if you're wondering why you're seeing my blog here on the home page rather than my the, my sales materials, that's why I've had I've had some issues with WordPress. And again, uh, it would change, and I haven't even done anything to the site because WordPress is just too too dynamic and I I have just had enough. All right, well, enough about me. Let's get talking today about the issues of this particular week or what my topic is. And in this case, I am going to be talking about beaver water management devices. Now, specifically, I'm going to be talking about culvert protection. So beaver water management devices fall into two major groups. The first one is culvert protection to prevent beavers from damming in your culverts. The other one is flow devices that are installed through beaver dams. Now, sometimes those two elements overlap, but they are, in a sense, separate concepts, but they're very related. But this week, we're just going to talk about culvert protection. So obviously, for those of us in the more northern tier, this is getting a little late in the year to be applying beaver pipes and that sort of thing. But you know, if you still have open water, you can still get her done, as they say. Uh, for those of our more southern neighbors, of course, you can, you don't have the freezing conditions, so you can install these year round. So One of the things that sometimes is missed in our, you know, the so-called environmentalist mantra that, you know, we're destroying the planet, blah, 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 you know, what's called the litany 
of all negative information, we often don't hear about the good information. That is, at one time in America, beaver were significantly what's called extirpated. So they're not extinct, but they've been eliminated from major portions of their home range, of their range. Not home range, of their uh their range in terms of where their population used to be. For example, in Massachusetts, they actually had to import beaver to try to help reestablish beaver within the state. They were effectively eliminated through the vast majority of the state. And that occurred not just in Massachusetts, but in other states as well. Now, it was probably due to a variety of things. Of course, over-harvesting would be, certainly be one of them. But you also have to consider, you know, the draining of the draining of streams, the cutting of the forest, and also water pollution would all play a role in that. However, of course, we finally figured out that they were we were doing things wrong, and then some changes were being made. And of course, beaver are now pretty much established where they used to be before the white man came to America. So that's really a good news story and this is sometimes a good news story that you often don't hear about you just hear about all the bad things humans do and humans are the terrible thing in the world and we're just destroying everything and how much better everything would be if humans weren't around but you I mean just blah 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 right and so this is uh, of course utter nonsense um but nevertheless uh we did do some bad things to beavers, but we also did some good things to beavers, and we brought the beaver back. And so when you bring an animal back, especially one as industrious as beaver, you're going to have conflicts, and we need to find ways to manage those conflicts. Now, trapping of beaver is one way to manage those conflicts, okay? So I'm not devaluing trapping. Trapping is an import, plays an important role in beaver management. And it will, and I hope it never goes away. Beaver is wonderful fur. It has <clears throat> caster, and sometimes trapping is the only effective or cost-effective method of managing of managing beavers. And there's nothing wrong with that. I I think part of, as I've said before, if you've been following my podcast, I believe that sometimes we're doing wildlife damage management because we fail to do wildlife management, and trapping. The fur trade is part of responsible wildlife management. Unfortunately, uh, the animal rights protest industry and our changing values within the culture no longer sees fur as valuable and as a green resource. And so instead, people want to have petroleum products on their body. Uh, and so this is a rather sad thing, and it just shows the hypocrisy and the short-sightedness of what I call the so-called uh, environmental movement. But anyways, that's probably a subject for another podcast. Nevertheless, beaver are back, and that's a good thing. But there are situations where we have conflicts in here's an example of one of them. Now, this particular dam does, has not blocked the culvert in other words the culvert is still free of debris and that it allows water to go through however you can tell that the water level here has risen pretty far high you can notice that the beaver have uh, these trees are soon going to be dead as they get flooded out and drowned basically but the culvert is not working as it should not because there's something wrong with the culvert but because the beavers have stopped the water flow to the culvert. And so that can be a problem. Now, it may not be a problem. It may be a problem. Those are questions that have to be decided upon by, you know, uh, road engineers and this sort of thing. But as one of the challenges is when you have water rising this high, and that is there's concern about water seeping in under the road and then undermining the construction of the road. Now that takes, that's obviously not something that happens quickly, right? However, it can be a long-term potential problem out in the future. So what do you do? Well, one option would be to trap the beaver and remove the dam, okay? Another, but maybe you want the water level higher there. Maybe you want this as a potential source of water for the fire department, for example, right? So what they call a, a, a standing a standing line, okay? Uh, 
they, this would be a resource perhaps because there's no fire hydrants around and so the beaver have created a pond for you uh, so maybe so trapping wouldn't be an answer there. Uh, maybe that you can handle water level at this point, but if it gets higher, in other words, if the beaver build the dam up even higher and the water level even gets higher, then that would be an issue for the road. And so how do we prevent that? And that's where beaver flow devices that are used for culverts can be very uh, play in a very important role. So the point is, is I want you to understand as a wildlife control operator, you have options and it's important to give those options to your clients. Too often in our industry, we just, it's just kill it. And killing is an important role. In many situations, killing is the really the most practical option. However, we are, we do have other options in many situations. So rather than maybe doing 99% killing, maybe we should only be doing 80% killing. Okay. So this is where we need to sign up, up our game a little bit. And of course, the culture is changing. Here's another example of a beaver dam. Now notice it from this photo, it looks like the dam is actually higher than the road. That can be a concern if there is a, a breakout of that particular dam. If, that, if you have a catastrophic collapse of that dam, that could be serious because the water could undermine, potentially undermine the road. And then of course, here what, here's what we usually refer to as block culverts. Here we have a, a dam up against the culvert and the culvert is not working as it should because it's allowing the water to get higher on the other side of the culvert. And the culvert is to not obstruct water flow. Okay, and the beaver came in and said, hey, this is awesome. I'm gonna dam this up and this is gonna be perfect for me. And that's what they do. And this could be, you know, it costs money for counties and cities to come out and keep on blocking these. And sometimes they actually damage the pipe in their attempt uh, to unblock them. And uh, that can be quite expensive to rip out that pipe, rip out the road, and to have to replace it all. So why do beavers select these pipes? Why do they select these culverts? Well, uh, Part of the reason is, is that the culvert is less than the width of the stream, okay? So we have created a pinch point that makes it easier for the beaver to dam the stream. Animals are like us, they're lazy too. I mean, why work when you don't have to work and the culvert substantially reduces the amount of work a beaver has to do. Another reason is, is that the culverts increase sound and they increase water speed because there's no friction through there or where there is friction, it's creating noise. Beaver Dam, based on two primary things. The first one is noise. They did a study once where they had a, a tape recorder, they had a beaver in a room and some debris and they had a tape recorder of just running water and the beaver gathered up the debris and buried the... Uh, tape recorder, which is pretty neat. So the beaver is motivated by sound. The culvert can in increase that sound. And then, of course, the water speed. Beaver want to slow that water speed down, and that's what a dam, of course, does. Now, I do want to point something out here with this particular photo. Removing dams from culverts is dangerous. Where this gentleman is standing is risky, okay? It may be a low risk, but if that dam all of a sudden collapsed, he's he's in a world of problems. He's in a world of hurt there, okay? This is also the case when you come into clearing those culverts. As a rule of thumb, it's not always possible, but as a rule of thumb, you want to be removing the dam from the upstream side. You really don't want to be on the downstream side pulling away at a culvert because if you pull the wrong wrong log or the wrong stick and that's sort of like the, the finger in the dam sort of thing and all of a sudden you pull that out and all of a sudden the whole dam collapses, it could kill you through drowning or you could get hit in the head it could injure you severely I'm going to encourage you if you're involved in this type of work that you 
of course, be extraordinarily careful. Think, 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 think some more, think some more, get the right equipment. Don't work alone. You may need to be thinking about having, you know, tie off ropes so that if you, you know, if something happens, you're not getting sucked down the pipe. I mean, it's a lot of variables here, so I don't think there are any OSHA guidelines <laughs> for doing this, right? If there are, they're probably so expensive, no one would be able to do this work by hand. But be very, very cautious. This podcast is not about how to clear culverts. This podcast is about how to protect culverts from being dammed in the first place. So beware. All right. I don't know what, and I would love, I would welcome your thoughts. Those of you that may have done a lot of this, I would love to have you on the show and talk about the best methods of uh, clearing culverts by hand uh, if you're involved in any of that type of work. So be very, very careful. So how do we protect culverts in advance? Now, I know that's a very unusual thing for Americans. We tend not to do things in advance. We always wait till there's a crisis and then throw a bunch of money at it. However, there are occasions where you will find clients who may have had a pre-experience in the past and now they're in a new location or maybe they're saying, I can't afford to have this culvert plugged because there's a difference between having the culvert plugged on the edge versus inside the culvert. Sometimes beavers will dam directly inside the culvert and those can be very hard to remove and can be quite expensive. So if you're in a situation where you can do things in advance, you have some you have various options and we're going to talk about that today. So one of the simplest of course is just putting a grate over the culvert. You say, well, that doesn't really do a whole lot of protection. Yes, it does. It provides protection insofar as the beaver is not able to enter the culvert and dam it inside the culvert. Now, you need to protect it on both sides, the upstream side and the downstream side. Now, if you're looking for something that is going to be a little more uh, permanent in the sense that if the beaver begins to dam, it won't matter because we're still going to allow water flow, then you have something that's on the right. Now, I am not recommending this particular design. This is the design I created back in the day, uh, way back in the 90s, before a lot of this information was out, or at least before I was aware of it per se. And the company wanted me to protect some culverts in advance because they couldn't they they needed to have these the water constantly flowing so what you're doing is you're taking hog panels and you're block putting out a fence around the culvert and then putting pipes through it now you don't have to put pipes through it but piping through it allows the opportunity that if the beaver decides to dam it up water is still allowed can still get through and you can see that and you can see that sort of design there. There is another type of culvert protection known as the sort of, I would call it a mesh cylinder. I'll have better photos of that later, but basically it's a large circular cage that's partially inserted into the culvert, and then it extends out, oh, maybe 20, 30 feet, so the beaver can try to dam it, but beavers tend not to dam things that are in parallel with the stream. Beavers always want to be damming perpendicular to the stream. So to kind of give you a little picture here, if the stream is flowing this way, the beaver wants to create a T. They tend not to dam on the side of something. They tend not to dam that way, where the, the line of the dam is in parallel with the stream flow. That's something they just don't do. So that's where having that cylinder come out provides water to get through. Plus you have so much surface area, it would take a long time for a beaver to dam that up. So in light of these issues, we have what's called beaver deceivers. And this is the name used by, I believe by Skip Lyle. I don't know if he invented the name, but certainly he is a forerunner in this particular field of creating these devices to protect culverts from beaver damming. Again, it doesn't stop the damming, it stops the beaver from being able to stop water flow through that culvert. 
Okay, so beavers will sometimes dam up. Now you'll notice that all of these these designs try to minimize the perpendicular portion where the fence is perpendicular to the water flow. This is why you'll have this sort of diamond design, sort of um, a keystone type design. Now keystone, is, we'll see another example of that. That's a trademark term now. But the idea is that you have these long lines that are in parallel to the water flow that beaver tend not to dam. And that is one way to prevent beavers from damming it up. Now, you'll notice the image on the far right where there is a little bit of a space between the fence and the culvert protection. I mean, the fault culvert protection and the pipe. That is to allow animals to sneak around the fence, such as turtles and sometimes fish and larger mammals. Because when we're using these, uh, uh, what do I want to call them here, uh, hog panels, those are six inch by six inch weave. If you're smaller than that, obviously an animal can get through that. But if you're a larger snapping turtle, you're going to get wedged, and now we've prevent now we've created a barrier that prevents crossing. Therefore, we would force animals over the road, increasing the likelihood that they're going to get run over. So he created this particular model. So I don't know how many inches it is. You'd have to look up his particular work, but you notice that there's a little bit of a gap. Something larger, obviously larger than six inches. Otherwise, why would you do it? Probably maybe he's gone out a foot or so so that an animal can then kind of sneak around that edge and get back through the, through the uh, culvert and get and follow and continue going downstream or coming upstream, for example. All right, let's take a look at some websites now. And so let me pull this up. This is a publication from Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And so this particular publication is, I'll just give you the title, Resolve Beaver Conflicts with an Ounce of Prevention. Now we know that Americans don't believe in prevention, but nevertheless, we're gonna learn about these particular methods right here. So it's talking about trapping, and I'm just gonna scroll down here a little bit more. Talks about some of the damage. Now, I want you to take a look at some of these photos that he has. Let me kind of blow this up for you. Now, this is a rather sophisticated design for a culvert protection device. Notice it, notice it has the cage, but then it has this large elevated pipe. Clearly, this pipe was made because they don't it, they won't they don't mind if the beaver dams that particular location and raises the water level. They just don't want the water level going above that particular line. So that is certainly one way to be doing it. So you have to ask the question: What is the water level that the client can tolerate? What is the, and you want to try to have these devices used in places where uh, there's a little bit of tolerance for some water, water level rise. Not You don't have to have a lot of tolerance, but you want to have a little bit of tolerance, right? And typically you will, right? Because there's always overbuilding when they're creating these types of situations. So that is certainly one thing to look at, one design. I just want to show you some designs to look at here scroll down here is another this is through a dam we'll talk about that some more uh, in another in a future podcast but here's another one here we have that trapezoidal look again you notice these long lines these in parallel with the stream flow so that because beaver tend not to dam that way here's another example again where you have this sort of trapezoidal look to it now, when you're building these, it's important that you have to have a floor on them as well. Now, the picture I showed earlier of my work, I didn't have a floor on mine, but New England tends to have extraordinarily rocky streams. So I don't think it'll be a long-term problem. But nevertheless, you do need to have, uh, you wanna put a floor in it because beavers sometimes will dig underneath your fence and uh, then can get access to your, to your culvert that way. So you need to get some uh, 
stake drivers, uh, pole drivers, because you're going to be pounding these things down into the ground. You want to probably get some, you don't have to get galvanized uh, hog panels, but that certainly can help. The hog panels will last a while. And again, you're, you're using the hog, hog panels are pretty strong. You want to be sure that it's durable, particularly those of you out in ice areas. You want to build these strong because ice will can break these down over time. So make sure you build, you build them strong. Here's another example where they've created, it's this little messy here, but notice they had to create some fencing on the back side. This was to prevent a beaver from climbing up onto the, uh, up onto the embankment and then accessing the culvert from the, from the roadside. So you have to ask how steep is this particular location? Do I need to have a fence from the road to prevent beaver from coming at it from the other side? So you've got to keep that in mind as well. And again, they're using the pipe formation. So in case the beaver dams it all up, you can already see the debris collecting. And that should let you know that these, you say, well, I want to keep trapping location for years. And that's how I keep making money off my client. Understand that when you install these beaver pipes, you're not just done. You're going to hopefully sign up the client for a, uh, for a monitoring fee, right? So that you're going to come back and make sure you maintain these devices because they do break down. They sometimes get plugged. Beaver sometimes are very aggressive and they find a weakness in what you've done. Uh, and you'll need to make sure that sometimes they need to be cleared away. Some of the debris needs to be cleared away to, to maintain the appropriate water flow that the device was supposed to be ensuring. So you should have that kind of a contract with your client. Now, you're not going to get it for all of them, obviously, but they may find over time it may be cheaper for them to pay you a few hundred dollars a year to monitor the location. You're looking at at least once a year some locations may need twice, uh, but it shouldn't be a ton of work for you. And it allows you to keep maintaining that yet FaceTime with your client as well, letting them know, oh, we have a, we have a, a beaver guy or a beaver girl who can uh, handle maybe other problems that we have, right? So that can be something for you to definitely take advantage of. Scroll down a little bit more. Here's a very sophisticated version here. Now it seems to me that I'm, I suspect that what happened here is they probably dropped the water level down enormously and now they're anticipating where a beaver would dam it. And that's why the pipes are this high. That, that's my guess, I don't know. But uh, typically these pipes would be in the water but again, you don't have to have them in the water, right? You can say, look, we're fine if the water level gets this high. And that's your call, but otherwise I would have them at the bottom. Now you don't want these pipes sitting on the ground on the floor of the pond if you can help it. You wanna have at least, you know, if you can get them off a few inches, that's important because you don't want silt and debris to start filling it up from the bottom. So you want them at least high enough off the ground off, off the floor of the pond to allow to keep them away from all the silt because silt will collect over time there as well so that's important here's another type of design again we have this sort of cage mechanism we're going to see this more when I do my talk on uh, putting in beaver flow pipes through dams Again, there you have that long longitudinal line in parallel with the stream flow. Beavers tend not to dam there. And here's another example of another one. You know, that's from the cage side. And here's a nice line diagram. Let me kind of shrink that up a little bit. Just to kind of move that. And again, you're looking to try to create these large longitudinal lines in parallel with the stream flow because beavers tend, it makes it harder for them to dam. And don't forget, you need to put a, a skirt at the bottom as well to keep the beavers from crawling, from digging underneath.
All right, well, that's going to be enough of that. Let's go on to the next one. Let's go to, this is a website I'm going to strongly encourage. I don't make any money off these people, so, but I do want you to see what type of work they do. They're based out of Massachusetts, and I, Massachusetts has been sort of a leader, a leading area for these beaver flow devices and culvert protection because of the law that was passed in 1996 called the Ban Cruel Traps Campaign from the Animal Rights Movement. So because they banned at that time conna bears and footholds and all kinds of things, it made it harder to trap beaver because a lot of people weren't going to be trapping with the suitcase traps, right? So other methods had to be done to prevent the flooding issues. And so this was, this company was started. Uh, I know one of the principles of the organization or at least I know his wife and here's his design you know again that trapezoidal look and he calls it a keystone and he's trademarked the word okay keystone design and he has it's amazing so there you go there's an example of one notice he's got the protection above the culvert to prevent beavers from coming in from the top side and it's rather pretty There's another example. Again, the beaver will probably come back and then fill this up and so, but it'll still allow that water flow. And if they're really aggressive, you put some pipes through it. But so you can see this is not, it's not rocket science, right? So, I, and I don't want you to think that it is rocket science. So why not do this? Why not offer this to your client? It doesn't take that long to build it. Uh, some of this work can be done in just a few hours once you get out there and now you've got something that's going to provide them some long-term protection for that culvert. It's a whole lot easier taking care of a dam on the outside here than right up against the culvert itself. And I'll give you one, one more design there. And See there you see the bottom of the cage where the, he has some a flooring there and then some stabilizing pipes. Again the stabilizing rods here because you have to be concerned about the weight of any dam that gets put in, put inside, but also the weight of ice. And of course, you would know your ice conditions in your particular area. But again, you always want to be thinking about overbuilding to prevent, because uh, you want this to be long term. This should this should last you for years. And so you may have an outlying year where you have like we had a, a time here uh, a few years ago where it was the second coldest date on Montana records so I'm very proud of the fact that I can't have the old timers telling me I remember when it was I'm like no 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 you're not telling me that I was here when we had below zero temperatures for a month never got above zero uh, so uh, let me say let me very fast it never got above freezing for a month and it was below zero for day, for days I believe that was the right thing and that was another uh, an amazing thing so the idea that it was always colder back in the day uh, maybe in the aggregate but we've had some really extreme cold weather here today as well and you might as well okay so just keep that so just keep that in mind another company and this is one I wanted I talked about earlier uh, again I don't have any personal knowledge of this particular device let me kind of blow that picture up for you here um, but I want to be sure you get, oh dear, here we go. Basically, <coughs> as I said before, it's a cage that's just sort of extended out into, it's like a, rather than having a metal culvert that's just solid, it uses a cage and extends that out into the pond, and that is your beaver deceiver, I guess, for lack of a better word, out here. And this is called Beaver Stop. And so it's a company where you can buy these uh, and just simply measure your culvert and they will sell you the right size and you just extend it out into the into the pond and anchor it down. Uh, it doesn't get much easier, I would think, than that. And that may be something that you want to try yourself. Now, if you're looking for a publication, this is certainly one that I'm going to suggest for you as something that you should consider. And you're going to look at, I'm going to look up Dale Nolte, that's N-O-L-T-E, N-O-L-T-E, Nolte. And 
the title of it is How to Keep Beavers from Plugging Culverts. Pretty simple title. And basically, this publication just goes through all the different ways to stop beavers, talks a little bit about their biology and what they're doing and different methods. It gives you all these different options to stop them from blocking culverts. And it gives you more options than what I have given you here. Okay, different ones. But I think you'll find that there's basically just variations on the same design. So if you have a client who's like, oh, I don't believe you, here's a 35 page document that would help support your case. Again, published in 2005, I think there's been some improvements since then. But again, it provides you some fundamental information, talks about repellents, let's just look at the table of contents here. Talks about shooting and trapping and devices that prevent them from damming, fences, water flow devices, and this sort of thing. And it gives you some additional options. And it's again, your tax dollars at work, so you might as well, that you might as well take advantage of it, to be sure. Now, what are some downsides of using these devices on culverts? Well, of course, there has to be some maintenance. Okay, that, so you just have to sort of recognize this. And then, of course, lastly, I mentioned the fact that it does inhibit wildlife movement, and that may be an issue as well. Uh, large turtles, large aquatic animals won't be able to get through the six inch weave of your hog panels. And in some of the designs that you may use, smaller animals may not be able to get through. It depends on the mesh size and that sort of thing. So there are some downsides. It's not just a complete full on win. So don't let the animal rights protest industry talk, uh, you know, just talk these devices up as if somehow there is no downside to them. There is a downside to them. Now, the question is with all things we have to ask, is it what what kind of down are the upsides better than the downsides right and so but don't let people just sort of poo poo the notion that if we're forcing larger animals to cross the road how many like with turtles they don't have a high reproductive rate and they need you know when we're killing the the big ones because drivers are so slow you know hitting them on the roads that's going to be a problem as well and those environmental issues have to be considered as well and maybe your client just wants to be ever gone because there's too much tree damage not just flooding as well so you have to ask these kinds of questions to make sure your client is going to be happy with the long-term results there one, one last thing to point out, and that is whenever you're disturbing a beaver dam, make sure you are abiding by your state wetland regulations. Some states, not all, some states prohibit the disturbance of a beaver dam because then you are disturbing a wetland. So make sure you know what the laws are in your particular state before you do any type of disturbance to a beaver dam. Last thing you want is installing a, a beaver fence and you have to remove part of the dam in order to get, get this done and then you run afoul of some other issues. So make sure you're pricing that in if you have to go through the work of getting a permit to disturb the dam because that's costing you time or making your client do it. You've got to make sure you work that out. The time to do this is before you have a client call. You're not going to be able to sell something you don't believe in. And I hope you've seen this. This is not rocket science. If I think I can do it and I've done a poor job on earlier models, I've just been recently been involved in another beaver pipe. And if I think I can do it and I am not a handy person, I am confident that the vast majority of you who are probably far handier than I am, that this would be a piece of cake and can add revenue and some goodwill for your company because all the people that hate trappers and hate wildlife control are going to say, well, you know, that's cool that he did that. And now you're able to maybe get in the newspaper and magnify your work and get some free advertising. So I hope you found that uh, useful. Again, my name is Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife.